Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, building futures close to home at campuses in Morgantown, Kaiser, and Beckley. Information at wvu.edu. Embassy Suites by Hilton Charleston, an all-suite hotel and conference center minutes from Yeager Airport and Capital Market. Reservations and brasserie dining information available at hilton.com. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Welcome back to the legislature today. I'm Bob Brunner. Thanks for joining us for tonight's coverage of the 2023 legislative session. It's adventure travel day at the legislature on an off-road enthusiast touting some mean machines on two wheels and four and some machines not so mean. Randy Yoey explains that. West Virginia adventure travel displays were not limited to inside the Capitol Rotunda. Just outside the governor's office, a row of high-end road warrior vehicles came complete with attachable camping gear. Now back inside, adventure travel outfits included a variety of Hatfield, McCoy, and other ATV trail runs, rides, and accessories. The New River jet boats drew interest, as did the Court Roads Jeep Club and the 132-mile Hellbender Motorsports Roadway Run. McDowell County's head of the Dragon Motorcycle and Sports Car Ride was organized to help bring economic development to the coal fields. And the Veterans Mission 22 display offered a road or trail ride to any former or current service man or woman who wants to hit the hills. But the wheels getting the most traction traveling through the state legislature right now have the smallest engine here and it's not even gas powered. I'm talking about e-bikes. Joseph Oberbaugh is the chief operating officer of Fish and Cycles just outside Parkersburg. He's also the author of House Bill 2062, which just passed the House and is now in the Senate. It's meant to align state e-bike laws with federal laws. The measure allows the most popular electric bikes made to be ridden in all West Virginia state parks. Oberbaugh says over the past five years, electric bike popularity has skyrocketed. It's skyrocketed. One of the main drivers was actually COVID. So um, after the lockdown and everyone got stuck at home, people started to look for ways to get out and do outdoor activities and social distance. And the e-bike market just exploded as an opportunity for people to, you know, get out, do exercise and, and social distance. State parks representatives set up an adventure travel. They said they were all in favor of opening up the parks to e-bikes. For the legislature today, I'm Randy Yoey. The Senate gaveled in a little early this morning to pass several bills relating to fiscal issues, including changes to the state's retirement systems. Senate bills 453 and 458 both relate to delinquent retirement contribution submissions, while Senate Bill 452 clarifies the definition of County 911 personnel and firefighters to ensure their inclusion in the state's emergency medical services retirement system. The Senate also unanimously adopted a bill that would make it harder to shut down or demolish a power plant in West Virginia after they suspended rules to move the legislation up in the schedule. Senate Bill 609 require a power plant's owner to seek permission from the state public energy authority to close or tear it down. It's, it's pretty simple with the grid stability, if not only this power plant, but any power plants going forward with the grid st uh, stability uh, an issue anymore. This just makes sure that it is uh, aired out and, uh, you know, make sure that it's, it's not going to crash our power grid. So I urge uh, passage of the bill. Additionally, the bill would require a third party to study the economic, social, and environmental impact of the plant's elimination. Senate Bill 609 was made effective from passage and now heads to the House. The Senate also enacted a change in leadership Friday. As Chris Scholes reports, the seemingly small change was met with great emotion. This past week, I... Senator Chandler Swope, a Republican of Mercer County, stepped down from the chair of the Senate Economic Development Committee Friday 
to allow Senator Glenn Jeffries, a Republican from Putnam County, to take over. Swope cited Jeffries' continued efforts to bring new companies into the state as the reason for nominating Jeffries as his replacement. So as a result, last night I came to the Senate President's office and asked, have you ever thought about naming the senior senator from the 8th chair of economic development? If he had that title, it might strengthen his appearance when he's out in, in the presence of the Warren Buffetts of the world. And after a little bit of arm twisting, he finally agreed, yeah, senior senator from the 8th would make an awesome chairman of the Economic Development Committee. Jeffries thanks Swope for having faith in him and acknowledged that despite his passion for economic development, he was slightly surprised to be tapped with the position. For the first time this session, Senate President Craig Blair spoke on the chamber's floors to laud Swope's selflessness. It is something that I have not seen the entire time that I've ever served in the legislature, and I am unaware of this ever happening. Where a member that was doing an exceedingly good job, seen an opportunity for not himself, not someone else, but for the state of West Virginia to do a better job of attracting business and economic opportunity to the state of West Virginia. There is, without question, a selfless act that each and every one of us in this chamber should aspire, aspire to being as the senator, the leadership, the senator from Mercer proposed yesterday afternoon to me. Blair went on not only to commend Swope's selflessness, but also Jeffrey's willingness to rise to the occasion for the service of the state. I've had a lot of amazing things happen in my life, but in this Senate chamber, as this Senate president, I believe that this is the most amazing thing and we should all remember and learn from it and remember that our goal is to make the lives of our citizens that we all represent, no matter what the district is, the best it possibly can be. And the leadership of you two far exceeds anything that I can bring to the table. Ladies and gentlemen, take a few minutes, stand up, and give a round of applause to both these gentlemen. For the legislature today, I'm Chris Schultz. The House of Delegates is planning its fourth public hearing of the regular session for Monday at 9 a.m. in the House chamber. The topic is House Bill 3270, which would change the state's workers' compensation law that allows workers to hold companies accountable for ignoring safety hazards that lead to severe injury or death. The bill's sponsor, Delegate John Paul Hott, a Republican from Grant County, says the tort reform bill attempts to gain some control over a highly volatile subject area in West Virginia pertaining to workers' compensation, deliberate intent. It is a unique coverage to the state of West Virginia. Uh, it is creating uh, financial hardship on businesses, specifically people in the timber industry, the coal industry, manufacturing, people who would have labor-intensive jobs, and um, workers' comp is not the sole means of settlement. It allows for additional litigation currently in our state. So the intent of this bill is to put some limiting factors in there. This bill will limit non-economic damages to $250,000. Fridays at the legislature, at least up to now, tend to be a little quieter as senators and delegates get home early for the weekend. That gives us a chance to evaluate what we've seen this week and what we expect to happen next week. Today, WVPB's Randy Yowie and Chris Schulz are joined in our Capitol Street studios by a veteran TV newsman, Bob Aaron. 
Thanks so much, Bob, for our Friday Reporters Roundtable. We have legislative reporter Chris Schultz, and we'd like to welcome Bob Aaron from WCHS Channel 8 and Fox 11. Bob, we're glad to have you here today. It's nice to be here, and I'm certainly an enthusiastic listener to public radio. <laughs> well, we appreciate oh, right. that. Um, let's talk about campus carry. That was the big story this week. This is completed legislation now. It is sitting on the governor's desk. I sat in on the public hearing a couple days ago where uh, out of 40 people, uh, 38 spoke against the bill, two spoke for. And one was an NRA lobbyist, right? That, that's exactly right. Um, what was your gather, Bob, on, on this whole campus carry issue? I think uh, the Second Amendment issue is so strong among West Virginia politicians that uh, it just seems to have a life of its own. Um, the colleges didn't want it, uh, universities didn't want it, uh, a lot of the students that spoke didn't, didn't want it, but it's here and uh, I assume the governor will sign it and even if he doesn't, there's probably the votes there to, uh, to veto it. Chris, or I, override we, the veto. Yeah, I agree, I agree wholeheartedly. Chris, what we heard from the college students and the college administrators were concerns over suicide, concerns over mental health, yeah. and I know you, t you covered a lot of that end of it. Right. Uh, so this bill came out of the Senate uh, before it made its way to the House. And as Bob just referenced, it's completed its legislative uh, action. So it, it's ready to go whenever the governor uh, is willing or isn't to sign it. So what we heard at the Senate, that's when we saw those those letters uh, from the universities. And both Marshall and WVU, if I'm not mistaken, mentioned this issue of mental health. And one of the things that we heard from uh, the presenters, both during and after the public hearing, was... Uh, the concern that the mental health crisis that we're currently seeing in the country, coupled with an increased access to weapons, will create a rise in uh, suicides. And, and, you know, we heard a couple of different people talk about the problem of, you know, a desperate situation, a desperate moment in someone's life ending in tragedy because they have this readily available uh, resource or tool, I guess, for lack of a better term. So, yeah, there's a lot of concern, and, and as we all know, having been college graduates, college can be a very stressful time. It's, it's a huge time of change in people's lives. And so um, there's a lot of other concerns that we've heard from the community, but that, that is one of the biggest ones, that you're bringing guns into an already uh, volatile situation. To say nothing of, there were also concerns about drugs and alcohol use as well. Well, I lost my son Adam to suicide. Uh, he was a, a college student uh, in law school at Appalachian School of Law and he took his own life with a shotgun and uh, I can see how these issues can concern people. Well I think that there'll be compensation and activities at the at our West Virginia colleges and universities uh, once and it, when this this kicks into action I have a feeling there'll be uh, quite a bit of activity. Yeah and the word compensation makes me think you know one of the biggest things that we heard on the Senate side I, I wasn't able to follow as closely when it went to the House this week but you know, this is going to create a new burden for these universities, and especially the smaller ones. You know, we focus on Marshall and WVU because they have uh, the communicative power to put out these letters and people pay attention. But the Concords and, and the other smaller schools in the in the state, we're talking about potentially at least thousands, if not millions, of dollars in uh, new security measures that they're going to have to take. You know, anything from metal detectors to metal wands to added. Um, you know, staffing at events to check to see if people, first of all, have a weapon and second of all, have the correct licensing, because you are supposed to have a license. And that's the whole point of this bill is to, as the Republicans have been saying, formalize something that they believe is already happening on our campuses. But the cost of this is, is a big unknown right now. Let's talk as well about the K through 12 uh, teachers here in West Virginia, because the bill and I think it's stalled a little bit. I haven't heard a whole lot about it. But this is the bill to let teachers be armed, to make them school protection officers, SPOs. And we've heard uh, stories on both sides of this. Uh, have you covered any of that, Bob? I've listened to some of that. You know, you, 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 I, and I guess there certainly are two sides to it. You, you hear a teacher say, I think, I think someone was in there that spoke, talked about uh, only having the locked door and a chair to throw between yeah. him and him and, and his kids, but a, a lot of teachers don't want that, don't want to do that, and uh, don't like the idea of firearms being introduced into an area where they're where they're not, and sometimes can fall into the control of somebody 
who, uh, who who's not necessarily the, the person that's supposed to have them. Yeah, that was Delegate Elliot Pritt. He's a seventh or eighth grade social studies teacher in Fayette County, and that's what he said. Yeah, I said, if I've got my students here and I got a gunman here and all I got a couple of chairs to throw, maybe it's not a bad idea that I have a gun. Your thoughts, Chris? Yeah, I think this is uh, a much a smaller part of a much larger mosaic with regards to school safety. I mean, just this week we've had such a stark reminder that this is a real issue in this country. And uh, I think, you know, we've seen efforts to arm teachers, we've seen efforts to bring in retired law enforcement and veterans of the military. Uh, even before the session, we had um, the Department of Homeland Security and the governor teaming up to create a school safety initiative. Um, this is, again, as I just said, you know, part of a much larger conversation that's going on, not just in our state, but in the country. And until leg legislative action continues on this bill, I'm really not sure where it's going to end up. Another issue that we heard raise its head this week was uh, splitting DHHR into three. We've been waiting for this proposal, and they've been putting this together uh, all year long. And, and Delegate Amy Summers, the head of the Health Committee in the House, presented it. And from what I heard, on both sides of the aisle, the sentiment was, well, it's got this problem, and hmm, maybe it's uh, not quite there, but it's the best thing we got right now. It's the best alternative to a broken system. It's been a problematic agency, and uh, um, they think that uh, by breaking it up and giving it three heads rather than, than one, maybe the people at the top will detect a problem uh, uh, earlier, I mean, there, there's lots of lots of problems. I think uh, I did a story this week where I, I reported that uh, I believe that uh, only 67 percent of the CPS worker slots were were filled, and uh, one county, uh, Berkeley County, didn't even have anyone. So it, it's uh, no, I was Morgan County. I'm sorry, but it, it, it's uh, it's obviously. A, a problem in a lot of different ways, but there's an awful lot of moving pieces and federal regulations. Their their budget amount is so large. I mean, it's 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 like half the the the, the state because they control so much federal money. Um, yeah, we heard uh, Senator Charlie Trump from the Eastern Panhandle sent that letter of, about a month back, and that's kind of really sparked activity amongst both foster care and for the whole DHHR itself. Yeah, uh, Senator Trump stood. Uh, I believe it was this week, uh, in support of the foster care ombudsman's bill, which foster care obviously falls under the very large auspices of the DHHR, to talk exactly about what you just said. You know, he's from Morgan County. There is no uh, representative in that county, and, and it's not the only one in the state as far as I understand. And so these oversights, these, uh, these things that these, this very large organization is not getting done is what the delegates kept, kept coming back to in that discussion. Um, you know, and maybe breaking it up and, and really siloing things out and making sure that the, the leadership that is leading those organizations to do these very important tasks in our state are more focused than, than a single individual is the hope. You know, this came out of the Senate day one. I mean, this was one of those bills that got pushed right through, uh, almost 30 bills. It was maybe the second or third one that got passed on the Senate floor on the first day of the session. Um, so, you know, we're now finally seeing the House take action. It seems, from what we understand, that uh, the governor is interested in this. He wasn't last year when it was a proposition of splitting it into two. Uh, the question now is, though, you know, the House passed their own bill, the Senate passed their bill. How are they going to bring these two ideas together? The governor told me about a week and a half ago that, well, that when they, he vetoed the bill to split it into two, it was two pages. He said this wasn't thought out at all. And even though the Senate put its bill out on the first day, uh, there had been months and months of preparation, as well as the House bill. And one thing I notice about both of these bills is that there's fluidity in them, that there's checks and balances before the split to three even happens, that the HHR administrators are charged with right now, because it won't happen until 2024, well, let's figure out how to make sure that we have the administration right, that we maybe have some administrators that work for all three, and that you know, cash flow is good, and that payroll is correct. So there's, it seems to be well thought out. The governor seemed earlier to, to view the, uh, the report that was developed for a million dollars 
as uh, the gold standard, but uh, uh, this will be a little bit different. He shied away from that now, mm -hmm. and, and I've heard feelings that, okay, the McChrystal report gets communication better, it de-silos some of these departments that were talking to each other, but the House and Senate bills now will put better function into helping the most vulnerable people, our children, uh, that need the help the most. Yeah. So, um, tax reform. I mean, it came and <laughs> mm. it, uh, it, once the Senate put out its surprise plan about 10 days ago, um, I mean, I talked to Vernon Chris, the head of the Finance Committee for the House, and he said, yeah, I'm listening to that. Uh, I'd like to check a couple of little things that they talked about, what de how it defines a small business and, and how, what about these veterans' payments. But there's communication, it seems, where we thought that there was none before. Yeah, supposedly they're meeting every Thursday, I guess, and, and getting together. Um, I know all the House people said they wanted a big bang if, or if what they did, they wanted a big impact. And I guess there's some talk about 30 percent now uh, in, instead of 15 percent. I don't know if that's enough of a bang to do it. Well, the concern that we keep hearing from the senators and, and that they really, really hammered home in their presentation of their plan was uh, doing this safely, doing this in, in a responsible way, I believe was, was the word choice. And, uh, you know, when the 30 percent ramping all the way up to 50 percent plan came out, they said that that was too much, too fast. Fifteen percent, as we discussed, uh, have been discussing since this was announced last week, would be a $600 million cut to the budget immediately. Uh, for next year. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see where that number lands. Um, but as, as I'm sure we might get to if we have time, there are still concerns about, you know, spending what we do have before it goes away with some of these cuts. You know, we, we are seeing a record surplus and that's been the, the justification for these tax cuts, but there's still a lot of concern. I mean, I just heard this week from the the libraries, the public library system, that they need uh, something like $56 million for deferred maintenance, $200 million in the Department of Corrections for deferred maintenance. So people are worried about that, and we're hearing about cuts, so it's going to be interesting to see how this ultimately gets balanced out. I mean, and then that's the term, balanced out. You're going to put how much taxes you're going to give back to the public on this side, and how much are we going to spend to keep the state operating on this side? And, and you know, just finding that balance is sets the question up on will we have tax reform at all. I would have said two weeks ago maybe no. Now I'll say maybe. <laughs> I think maybe the parties are past their personal animosities now and, and, and can move forward, but there, there were some pretty hard feelings when oh. this all started out. Corrupt and swamp were two big words that were being tossed around quite a bit. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the state using venture capital. This whole Form Energy company up in the northern panhandle has sparked a lot of debate about whether it's good to use state money like a private entity would as venture capital, this $105 million. There were a lot of senators and delegates that, that thought maybe this wasn't a good idea. It's a little bit different in this case because the state will end up, I guess, would own the uh, the former steel plant there there when it's all over and done with. But it always does come up as a question, and I'm sure a lot of you have been around for a while like I have. There were a lot of projects and groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings that uh, <laughs> never turned any turned into anything. Uh, Huntington Superblocks and. Uh, let's see, coal gasification plants that uh, don't think you see them around. <laughs> yeah, maybe this caveat of owning the land and the buildings is big enough. And I think Bob, Bob hit on really, you know, we saw this argument in the House last week and again in the Senate this week. The House tried to completely do away with this, with this gimme, as they would have called it. Um, and the Senate uh, people who were opposed to this tried a much more tactful approach. They just wanted to take $200,000 and give it to a retraining program. But ultimately the argument that, that came out was you know, giving away money and, and the defenders of the bill, their whole thing is we will own the land and also this money doesn't touch forms hands until X amount of jobs have been created, until X amount of production has been met. So I think that you, know, you would hope that what we're seeing in this bill is the lessons learned from those other projects that you alluded to, Bob. We got a couple minutes left. Let's talk about uh, a new House bill, uh, 3545, that just came out, and this is from Reverend Matthew Watts and his Tuesday morning group. The governor said he wants to put 500 million dollars of this 
COVID surplus money aside for economic development. And you've talked to Reverend Watts, and he thinks that money could be better spent elsewhere. Yeah, so Reverend Watts' proposal, his initial proposal at least, that he uh, put in front of workforce uh, development in the Senate a couple weeks ago, is it's all fine and good if you bring in these companies, but if we don't have the people to staff those positions, then we're just spinning our wheels. And so what he really wants to see is that money spent on communities uh, to help them get ready for the future economy that we're hopefully developing here in West Virginia. Uh, and so that's, that's what he wants to see is I believe his investment idea is $300 million in communities to help them bridge the gap between where they are now and where they should be to fill these jobs. He kind of got a cold shoulder from some of the, the, the committee members arguing, I guess, back that uh, the money was better spent on economic development. But uh, his argument is that you have to go to war with the army that you have and you have to come up with something for uh, the citizens that, that live here and need, and need help. And uh, he wants that money to go to those areas that need the, need the help. Well, there's people there also looking into whether this has all been properly spent, all of this COVID money that the governor has sent here and there into baseball fields and so on and so forth. And we'll just have to see how that plays out and if those investigations really come up with anything. Chris Schultz, Bob Aaron, thanks for being here today. A, a very insightful conversation, I think. And uh, let's see what happens further. What do we got? Two weeks left? No, three weeks left. Just about, uh, yeah. So, so it, it's more capital up. punishment. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for our roundtable. Back to you, Bob. Thanks for that, Randy. Tune in to the legislature today, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. I'm Bob Brunner. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. Support for the legislature today is provided by. West Virginia University, building futures close to home at campuses in Morgantown, Kaiser, and Beckley. Information at wvu.edu. Embassy Suites by Hilton Charleston, an all-suite hotel and conference center minutes from Yeager Airport and Capital Markets. Reservations and brasserie dining information available at hilton.com. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra. Freedom to grow. More information at segra.com.